Tonight on It's a Miracle. While repairing an industrial electrical box, a maintenance worker is struck by hundreds of thousands of volts, an accident that would eventually leave him totally blind. In many ways, I was like a child. It was hard to walk. It was like, uh, the way I can describe it is it's like walking in a canoe. And then, after 10 years of total darkness, something amazing happens. Plus, a three-year-old child dials 911 to save her mother's life. What's your name? Where's your mom at? She hurt her head. She hurt her head? And then the 911 operator learns something even more disturbing. It looks like a silly man, but it looks like a silly man. And I wasn't sure who she was talking about, if she was talking about if there was another person in the house that may have done this to her mom, that had come back to do some more to her mom. There very well could have been a perpetrator in the house. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. From PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Tump. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. You've probably heard the old saying, stop and smell the roses. Roughly translated, it means take time to enjoy the world while you can. Well, after seeing our first story tonight, you may want to stop and look at the roses as well. On October 9, 1990, 30-year-old Renee Poyer was working as a senior maintenance electrician at a computer company near Eau Claire, Wisconsin, when a massive power outage hit the entire complex. It was left to Renee, his supervisor, and a co-worker, Steve Eichinger, to repair the problem. I had gone to work alone on one electrical box, and Renee and my supervisor had decided to start on another everyone believed that the power was off but they were wrong and in an instant 100,000 volts of electricity would change Renee's life forever Steve was working 300 feet away all of a sudden I heard a loud cracking and popping sound Immediately, I knew something horrible had happened. I was very afraid going up there. I had butterflies in my stomach. I mean, my stomach sunk. I asked him immediately, are you okay? And he indicated then he could not see. The world was disappearing for Rene Poyer. He was going blind. And this cornea looks much like the right. Dr. James Redman, an ophthalmologist, was brought in to assess the damage. And now we'll take a look at your other eye. He did have a few small scratches on the surface of the cornea, small burns actually, and normally I would have expected those to clear up within perhaps a week or two, and likewise would have expected the vision to clear up also during that period of time on this side. I figured that the doctor knew what was going on, and that in a couple days I'd be back to work and life would be back on track. But it didn't work out that way. Renee's vision did not return. Renee had us stumped in terms of what is the actual reason for the visual loss. We certainly could not explain it on the basis of a, a specific eye problem, so we were left with is there some other area in the brain that's affected that we simply don't know enough about to make a determination? With no explanation for his blindness and little hope that his sight would return, Renee's life was turned upside down. In many ways, I was like a child. I went through a learning curve with everything I did. It was hard to walk. It was like, uh, the way I can describe it is it's like walking in a canoe. I do most of the cooking, and I had to learn how to cook, which 
turned into disaster many times. It was very depressing. It was very lonely. It was very scary. It was, it was a horrible, horrible time. But the cruelest punishment of all was never being able to see his two young daughters. They would grow up without his ever experiencing a father's joy of watching them change. It was very difficult for me to accept the fact that I wouldn't be the person that taking care of my family. And I wouldn't be the one to see him smile. And I, We had no clue to what the future would bring. We did not know what he was supposed to do now, where he was supposed to work, if he was supposed to work. And we both knew that at you know, age 30, that he couldn't not do anything. He had to find something to do. But no matter how hard he tried, Rene was unable to hold down a steady job. And then, one day, something unexpected happened. Someone call 911, please, quickly. What's going on? I think this lady's had a heart attack. I know CPR. Can you help me get over there? I'm blind. Back of the door. She's right over here. Renee immediately went into action. I couldn't find a pulse, and I couldn't hear her breathe. There wasn't anybody else there that said they knew CPR, so I had to do it myself. Ten minutes later, paramedics arrived and rushed the victim to a hospital. The family of the woman invited Renee to visit her so that she could express her gratitude. I said, I'm the one that should be grateful here, not, not you. You made me feel like I'm worth something again. And it was the first time since my accident that I felt good about being me. Renee's life finally had meaning. And so in the years to follow, he trained to become a physical therapist assistant, eventually landing a job at Sacred Heart Hospital where he became friends with the chaplain, Father Klimek. My brother was a patient here in the rehab unit, and Rene worked with him very, very closely. Left foot and right foot. Left foot. And uh, so uh, right by his patience, Good and his encouragement. Patients were more determined than ever to try to become very independent. And then on May 23, 2000, Renee's patience and encouragement was repaid in a way he never expected. Oh my God. I got a, a severe headache. It was just a crushing headache, pounding. and it was followed by a brilliant light. And then I realized that the trees are moving. I can see the grass. Oh my God, I can see. And I ran down nine flights of steps and down a hall to the chapel. And I dropped to my knees and I started to thank God. Thank you. It was beautiful. <laughs> Open the door, and there stood Renee, see, very, see. very excited. He said, what's the matter? He says, I can see, I can see. Father Clemick then walked me to the front door, and he says, Renee, go see what you've been missing. I laid down on my back on the grass, and I looked up, and I watched the clouds float by. I was very much overwhelmed by everything that had just happened. Rene rushed home to an empty house, and while he waited for his family to return, he took a moment to look through the family album. It was the first time in 10 years that he had seen the faces of the people he loved. But I was so happy that I could see them, and I was studying their faces, thinking in the back of my mind, if God would take my sight away now, I can't. I'd be happy because I could see him. Today, those who knew him during the years he was blind can offer only one explanation for Renee's sudden return to sight. <laughs> they called 
miracle, we can call it a special gift of God. But the beautiful thing of it, Rene has his eyesight. I know in talking with Rene that he views his vision return as a gift from God, and I'm inclined to agree with him because I certainly don't have any other explanation for why it suddenly improved. I love him more than words can say, and if there was anything I hoped for, for him, truly for him, it was to get his sight back. Oh, I've been given a second chance, and now I'm not going to let a second slip by. I am going to be busy with my family busy with my friends and I'm going to leave no stone unturned. Coming up, the incredible story of a three-year-old child who bravely faces a situation few adults could handle. Is your mom breathing, do you know? No, she died real bad. She died? Yeah. That really yeah. concerned okay. me when I really got very nervous that might have happened. He's dying. I cannot imagine okay. a three-year-old looking Where's at their mom and wondering, that? and really saying that she was dead. It must have been very scary for her. Never underestimate a child. You may not think they're capable of handling difficult situations, but then again, you might be surprised. The three-year-old in our next story did something remarkable in the face of danger. And when all the details came to light, it was not only remarkable, it was miraculous. It was December 5th, 1996, Fire Safety Week in Grand Junction, Colorado, and the Genesis Preschool had organized a field trip for their class of three-year-olds to tour the local firehouse. Here we go. Watch your fingers. Firefighter David Austin was in charge that day. I just like to walk through between the trucks, show them what the different parts are, the fire hoses and whatnot. I try to tell the kids not to be afraid of the firemen. Do you think that would be When it came time to teach the children about the importance of dialing 911, three-year-old Brittany McElfresh showed a special interest. If there was an emergency at your house, what numbers would we push? 911. 911. It's never too early for them to learn 911 and how to contact emergency services. I explained to them that 911 is not a toy. It's only for emergencies. I will use the scenario that what if you find mom and you can't wake her up? What number are you going to dial? 911. For young Brittany, the lesson learned that day would soon become the difference between life and death. Nine one one dispatcher Kendra Andrews answered Brittany's call. Nine one one, nature of emergency. When the coffers came in, I heard huh? some silence, and then I heard a small child talking, repeating what I was saying to her. Nine one one. Can I talk to your mom? She's got a little sick on her head. She's got a sick on her head? Yeah. Is she she sick? sounded very yeah. concerned and very she anxious. She hurt her head? A lot of calls with little kids, you can tell if they're playing on the phone. And she was not. She was very calm and very sincere about what she was telling me. What's your name? Brett. Brett, where's your mom at? She, she's right here. Can I talk to her? Sure. OK. At that point, I realized that mom was not going to come to the phone. She hurt her head. She hurt her head? Yeah. Does she need an ambulance? Mm hmm She does? Kendra immediately dispatched an emergency unit to the scene. Yeah? yeah. We have to come over and get her, and then we have to fix her head. Um, OK, is she bleeding? Yeah, she's got to bleed on her head. She's bleeding on her head? How much is she bleeding? I was getting very nervous because I didn't know what had happened. Is your mom breathing, do you know? No, she died real bad. She died? 
That really concerned me when she kept insisting that her mom had died. And at one point, I really got very nervous that 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 maybe that might have happened. I cannot imagine a three-year-old looking at their mom and wondering, and really saying that she was dead. It must have been very scary for her. Just a little. It was at that point that Kendra learned that there was someone else in the house. She talked about a silly little man that was in the room with her. And I wasn't sure who she was talking about, if she was talking about if there was another person in the house that may have done this to her mom, that had come back to do some more to her mom. OK. Where's your dad at, Brad? Part of the reason I asked if dad was around is if he was the silly looking man that she was talking about, or if dad could help. And she told him no, that he was at work. There very well could have been a per perpetrator in the house. The dramatic conclusion when it's a miracle continues. Just days after learning how to dial 911, three year old Brittany McElfresh placed an emergency call. 911. Her mother was lying on the floor unconscious and bleeding from the head. The 911 dispatcher was trying to piece together what had happened when she learned that someone else might be in the house with the young girl. It looks like a silly man, but... It looks like a... It looks like a silly man? Yeah. Volunteer paramedic Lee Hyde was the first to arrive on the scene. Hello? I could just kind of barely see the mom. It was kind of a difficult angle to see. The little girl would not let me in the house. I was a stranger to her, and she was not going to let me in the house. But she was on the phone with the uh, 911 dispatch. Who's there? Oh, wait. There's a squad person there. Come to the door. Moments later, the rest of the paramedic team arrived. Luckily, David Austin was among them. Brittany recognized the man who'd taught her 911 and finally opened the door. Hi, what's going on? Dispatch? Uh-huh. This is Lee with Cliff and Rescue Squad. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye. I was very relieved once the rescue squad got there because I knew that my job was over and that the people that needed to be on scene were there. From evidence at the scene, they were able to piece together what had happened. While feeding her children breakfast, some baby food spilled on the floor, causing the young mother to slip and hit her head during the fall. Her condition was serious. She had already lost a great deal of blood and her brain had begun to swell. It was a very good thing that the little girl called 911 when she did because the longer a head injury goes without being treated, the worse that it can be. She could have possibly had a stroke um, or been uh, brain dead in a matter of hours. Robin McElfresh was rushed to the hospital where she was diagnosed with a severe concussion and treated for her injuries. When her husband, Lee, arrived, they both learned what a brave and miraculous thing Brittany had done. When I woke up in the hospital, a nurse came to me and said, wow, your daughter saved your life. And I said, no, sorry, you're wrong. When they told us that our daughter, three and a half years old, had dialed 911, uh, my wife and I both were in disbelief. And they said, no, we've got her on tape. It's her. And I just thought they were wrong. I, I, She's, she was only three, she's very little. I just thought that was impossible, but it wasn't. You saw an angel? And what did it look like? But just how truly miraculous that day was only became clear when Brittany told her parents that the silly little man she mentioned to the dispatch operator was actually an angel. And we said, what silly man angel? Because we hadn't heard anything about this. We said, um, oh, really? And, and what did he do? She said, he just kept saying, keep, keep telling them, Brittany. They'll know. They'll come and they'll help you. And we said, did he dial 911? And she said, no, I did that myself. And he just helped me not be scared. 
I think two or three nights later, the fireman came to our house and gave us a copy of the 911 tape. It looks like a silly man, but... It looks like a, looks like a silly man? The tape only confirmed what Brittany knew all along. And nearly five years later, she remains absolutely convinced of what she saw that day. Tell me if you can't make it. When I told my mom, she did not believe me. And I just said, this really happened, Mom, you have to believe me. I knew what I saw because I saw it for reals. There absolutely was an angel watching over Brittany. I think there was an angel watching over all of us that day. Every day I wake up and I thank God that my daughter's here and that she helped me and that I'm here. I'm still blown away by it every day. I'm, I look at her and I can't believe that, you know, she loved me that much to really, you know, know, sense that there was something wrong and to take care of it. And I couldn't be more proud or more in love with, with that little girl. It's a very unusual situation for a parent to owe her life to her child. But then Brittany McElfresh is a very unusual child. She joins us now with her entire family from their home in Grand Junction, Colorado. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Mr. Thomas. How's everyone doing? Very doing good. good. Thank you. Great. I am still amazed by what Brittany did that day. And the fact that she's only three years old. Tell me, has she always been this advanced for her age? Yeah, I think so. Since she was little, she picked up things real quick. Now, I know you're not at all biased, but just how smart is she? She's got it together. She does real well in school. She's real, real advanced, and but mainly she loves helping people. Well, she certainly proved that the day of the accident. Now, I heard that something happened in a bookstore in connection with the angel that Brittany saw that day. Would you mind telling us about that? Yeah, that was, um, it was quite a while after our after the accident, and we hadn't really heard about the angel for a while, and I went into a Christian bookstore to get something, and when I turned around, Brittany was standing looking at a picture, and when uh, I turned around, she was crying, and I said, what are you looking at? And she said, oh, Mommy, it looks just like my angel. And that was the closest to we've gotten to a description of that angel. But it was pretty pricey, so we moved along, but it, it was a really neat, it's a beautiful picture. Well, Brittany, we have a little surprise for you today. Oh, Brittany. Oh. Look at that. Is that your angel? Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. You're very welcome. And thank you for sharing your incredible story with us. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. See you later. Stay with us for more amazing miracles. Next, a man fights to stay alive on kidney dialysis machines, but his time is running out. It's hard to see somebody that you care about attached to a machine that's chugging, chugging, and you hear the blood pressure going low and bells going off, and you think, you know, it could be any minute even attached to the machine that he may not make it through. If his blood pressure goes too low, he can die. Now his only hope is a donor kidney, and how he finds one is nothing less than a miracle. Our next story is remarkable because it shows that as human beings, while we may be different on the outside, inside, we're all basically the same. And if we could just remember that, what a better world this would be. Fifty-three-year-old Terry Buckwalter always dreamed of becoming a baseball coach. But in 1980, he bought a neighborhood bar, the Belgrade, in Moline, Illinois. And over the next 20 years, Terry traded in his dream for a thriving business. I never realized I'd become a bar owner, but it just happened and it turned out it happened to be a good thing. There's a lot of people out there that are really good friends now. In fact, most of my closest friends now uh, come from my uh, clientele. 
But even Terry's closest friends didn't know the terrible secret he was hiding. His kidneys were slowly failing. He just started progressively getting sicker. He couldn't sleep, and he wouldn't eat right, and he would come home from work exhausted all the time and try to sleep, get up, and not sleep. His wife Kathy watched helplessly as his condition continued to deteriorate. He had been sick for almost the whole time we'd been married, and his kidneys were just deciding after 20 odd years to give out. I said, you need to do something. Terry turned to dialysis treatments to stay alive. But his doctor, V.R. Alla, knew it was only a temporary measure until a donor kidney could be found. If he does not uh, receive the dialysis treatment, his poisons will increase in his system, and uh, eventually he go into coma and die. It was uh, very difficult for him to accept, and um, he get emotionally ups and downs. Hopefully I won't have to do this too long. Some people's body can take it and some can't. And I was the one that couldn't take it towards the end. And so I knew that I didn't have much longer because uh, you can't go on like that. I'm gonna go to sleep. Okay, you have to watch you sleep. It's hard to see somebody that you care about attached to a machine that's chugging, chugging, and you think, you know, it could be any minute even attached to the machine that he may not make it through. If his blood pressure goes too low, he can die, uh, even on the dialysis machines. There is a, a sense of impending doom it's keeping you alive, but your life is not good. It was terrible. Eventually, it became impossible to hide his illness from his friends at the bar. People were worried about him. I mean, he'd come in and he would just, you know, he had no energy. He just looked bad. He was losing weight. He looked very bad. Just to be honest, at most times, we, I expected him not to be here the next day sometime. Terry's days were numbered. His only hope was a new kidney. Of course, my kids offered to give me their kidney, but I just did not like that idea because I knew that the kind of disease I had is hereditary. And I felt real bad if they give me one of their kidneys and then down the road that they would acquire the disease that I had. I just couldn't live with that. So I was prepared just to wait for a cadaver. But the wait for a suitable organ could take years. And so one night at the bar, Terry made an unusual offer. Guess what, guys? Anybody wants to give me a kidney? They can drink free the rest of their life. Yeah. 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 Let's go. I'll go for that one. That's just a joke now. And everybody started laughing, and I started laughing, you know. <laughs> but one man in the crowd wasn't laughing. Dee Pollard was too concerned. That's when the thought process started of what I could do or what else could be done. So I approached him and asked him, what was he going to do? And he said, what can I do? You know, I got away. He said, I'll give you one of my kidneys. He said, I'd like to do that for you. It was just out of the blue. I mean, I was shocked that here's a, a guy that knew me, but not that well, and uh, would do something like that. Hey, Dee, what's up? Hey, how you doing, sir? Uh, are you serious? Uh, the next day, Terry approached Dee again, just to make sure he'd heard him right. I said, were you really serious about uh, giving me a kidney? And he goes, he said, I, I'm prepared to do that. I want to do that. Well, I knew it was still a long way from being a match. So my hopes were up, but they weren't up that much because uh, anything could happen. Not everyone was happy with Dee's decision, especially his sister, Gary Ann Gamble. I first heard it through my mother. I didn't hear it through Dee, and I didn't like it. And I'm sure he didn't tell me because he knew I wouldn't like it. Naturally, the first thing that went through my mind was, does he need the kidney because of the bar? Has he been drinking? You know, what's the problem here? He told me that it wasn't from drinking, it wasn't from abusing his body, it was just that Terry had been ill for several years with a kidney disease. So I asked him, what makes you feel that you need to be the one to do this? And he said he just felt in his heart that this was the thing that he should do. He said he had some spiritual feeling that he was called to do this. I'm going to go ahead and get your blood pressure here and check some things out and get okay. your med list here. Sounds good. And so Dee Pollard began the series of tests that would seal Terry Buckwalter's fate. So after he took the first two or three tests and he came back and he said they were encouraged up there that everything's going well, then I started thinking, well, God, maybe this is my angel. 
In the tissue match, uh, they uh, went with uh, the antigens, and out of six antigens, I, was, uh, I matched four out of six, which made it more like a relative. He come in and said, well, they called me. They said uh, they want to do the operation in about two weeks. And it sort of shocked me. <laughs> I said, two weeks? I said, wow, <laughs> they don't mess around. The operation was scheduled for November 6th, 1998. It would be a first. The first time in Iowa a living black donor would give an organ to a white recipient. I assumed that two races wouldn't necessarily mix. That's not true. Kidneys here. Kidneys here. Your kidney is your kidney, and it's pink and pink and pink. Whether you're yellow or black or white or red, it's pink. The seven-hour operation was even more successful than anyone had anticipated. The first thing they do when they get out of the anesthesia is they actually ask about the other one. I was anxious to find out what happened during his surgery. When Dr. Rahill came into the room and said that surgery was successful, that when they put my kidney in him, that it started pumping right away. I just thank God right then and there. And they couldn't believe how fast it was working. His color came back, he was sitting up in the bed. They didn't put him in the same room together, they were across the hall. So you'd see these two guys in their little hospital garb shuffling across the room going, how do you feel? And the other one would go fine, and then they'd go back, and then the other one would shuffle across the hall, watch the little flap in the back, <laughs> giving the nurses a thrill, <laughs> keeping them on their toes, but it was great, it was great. The fact that the kidney started working right away faster than they said any other one ever had, it was amazing, just amazing. I think that's the biggest thing. And the second biggest thing would be the way the community reacted. When we got back to the bar together and uh, everybody was there, they were very congratulatory, you know, a lot of high fives. I couldn't swing them because my side hurt. <laughs> so a lot of low fives on my end. Since the operation, Terry has returned to his old self even hitting occasional home runs. Oh, yeah, get out of here! Get out of here! For Dee, that's the greatest reward of all. To see him enjoy life the way that he was planning on doing it before, you know, he had gotten sick, it puts a real good feeling in your heart. To run and play ball, feel good, it's just unbelievable. It's just fantastic. Well, it is a miracle. You had a good game tonight. Yeah, finally hit one, huh? Yeah. Yep. Finally get one over the fence. That's right. Huh? The home run that I actually saw. Hey, come on, give me five. He just is everything to me. You just can't repay somebody that does something like that. But you can be there if he ever needs help, and he can just be his friend. And that's uh, what I'm trying to be. There's a, a, a bond yeah, there always. that can't be broken. Terry's two people. He's um, D and Terry together, because and that'll be forever. The wind blew it. The wind blew it. It was a gust, 25, 30 mile per hour. It must have been your kidney, D, because I couldn't hit one without it. You may be wondering if Bucky lived up to his promise of free drinks in exchange for a kidney. Well, it was actually a joke, but Bucky got lucky. D isn't much of a drinker, and so Bucky only has to treat him to a soda now and then. We'll be right back. Next, while leaving his home one day, Roy Grammer spots a suspicious-looking man lurking near some garbage cans. I stopped to ask him, what are you doing here? And that's when he started pointing towards a garbage can. Something in the trash? I heard a sound like the sound of a small kitten or a cat. And once I opened the lid, nothing came out. But Roy is about to make a shocking discovery when It's a Miracle continues. It's time for another in our series of profiles of miracle children. Tonight, a story of hopes and dreams and the child who made them come true. Raymond and Elizabeth Reyes were married on October 23, 1972. And like other young couples, they dreamed of raising a family. But sadly, as the years passed, they were unable to conceive. So uh, the only thing we would uh, have to do is to adopt, and that's how we begin our process in adoption, adopting our son. It was nice for us to have a boy, but 
I still wanted a little girl to make our family complete. I started preparing her room by buying a, a baby crib and clothes and a stuffed animal. But the adoption agency was unable to find them a baby girl. Days went by, weeks, months, years. I never gave up hope that someday I would get the, the baby that we always wanted. And then one day, while working on his garbage collection route, something caught Raymond's eye. I was cleaning up alleyways, and I saw something that looked like a shrine. Walked up to it, and I saw this folded paper. I grabbed it and opened it up, and it was a, a saint. I could not believe somebody would throw something like this away. Yeah, I brought the picture home, gave it to my wife to give it to my mother-in-law because she collected saints. You got When Elizabeth showed the picture to her mother, she learned that the saint might have a very special meaning in her life. She's beautiful, but she I can't have it. My mother said that picture was the picture of St. Teresa, um, the saint of, of babies. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, this picture is going to bring you a little girl that you wanted. When we first got the picture, we framed it and hanged it in uh, the baby's room. And I would always look at her and say, you know, how much longer is it going to take? Two weeks later, another man, Roy Grammer, was leaving for work when he noticed a man lurking near some garbage cans. He was kind of suspicious looking and, you know, kind of just looked like he was looking for something. I stopped to ask him, what are you doing here? And that's when he started pointing towards the garbage can. I started walking towards the can. Something in the trash? Yeah. I heard a sound like the sound of a small kitten or a cat. Once I opened the lid, nothing came out. But Roy could still hear the strange sound, and so he dug deeper into the garbage, expecting to find a small animal. And then all of a sudden, I seen these little fingers just wiggling. And then that's when I realized that it w was a baby. Okay. You could tell that she was only a few okay. hours old. Okay. It's okay. And that's when it hit you. How could somebody do this? Okay. There was a mattress so leaning up against the fence. So I, def I flipped it down on the ground. Okay. Laid her down on the mattress. Oh. Here you go. Oh. Oh. W rolled her up in the sweatshirt so she'd be warm while well, I called 911 so that I uh, wouldn't be trying to hold her. And the lady asked me, she says, what's the emergency? And I said, well, I just found a baby in the garbage can. And she said, well, we have ambulances rolling. Moments later, paramedics arrived to take the newborn to a nearby hospital. I found this baby in this trash dumpster right here. Okay, I thought she was her. a cat or something, the guy left her. Let me have her. They just grabbed her and took her, and you think to yourself that you'll probably never see her again. Even though she wasn't my child, I still wanted to know that she was being taken care of. By now, the local press had picked up the incredible story, and everyone in the small town of Guadalupe, Arizona, had heard of the child they were calling Baby Hope. Everyone, including Elizabeth Reyes. When I first heard the news, I felt that this was the one that we were praying for. Ray and Elizabeth felt that finding both the saint and the baby in the garbage was a miraculous sign. Yes, I'm, I'm calling about baby Hope. And so they Can called to inquire about adopting the child. Unfortunately, several other families had also called. Our chances were slim. My husband and I felt that we would not be able to get her because we were poor, and I kind of felt that that was going to keep us from getting Baby Hope. I asked, is this the money? And then one of the board members said, no, it's not the money. It's, we're not worried about the money. It's the love that you have for 
for the adoption. I said, oh, there's plenty of that in our house. And seven days later, they received the call they'd been praying for. Baby Hope? One of the board members said, let the Reyes family adopt Baby Hope. And that was our chance. Our prayers were answered. I was so excited about hearing the news that I was running around screaming, yelling. Thank you. Thank you. She's ours. Baby Hope. <laughs> <laughs> I started getting on the phone to tell everybody the good news that we, we were going to get Baby Hope. Yes, that's so scary. The next day, Elizabeth and Ray arrived at the hospital to meet their new daughter. Such a special child deserved a special name. We decided to keep Hope as Esperanza in Spanish and middle name Teresa for Saint Teresa, for being the saint that helped us. Elizabeth and Ray did not forget the man who found Baby Hope. And when Esperanza was six months old, they contacted him. I got a phone call that they wanted to meet me and, and said they had something for me for Christmas. Hi. Hi there, I'm, I'm Roy, yeah. That was a pretty, pretty exciting moment, really. I didn't expect to ever see her again. So you know it has to be a miracle. From that first meeting, Roy became like an uncle to Esperanza. He visits her every year on her birthday. They're doing a great job raising her. And that I feel privileged that they've allowed me to even be a part of it. It's been a long journey for Elizabeth and Ray since they first dreamed of having a daughter, and they have no doubt that she was brought to them by a miracle. When my husband found the picture of St. Teresa, that was the answer to our prayers in, in having Esperanza with us. I feel that this is a miracle if it wasn't for that uh, picture of St. Teresa. She had to be meant for us. Somebody answered our prayers. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>